Stephen Colbert is probably the smartest person I've ever met. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, a really a, a fantastic actor, something that I'm sure people will be seeing more of in the future. Mm -hmm. um, he is a hell of a singer. Very you musical. Do a song later? I song? would love to. Great. National anthem, maybe? Sure. Okay. <laughs> How about right now? You want to do the national anthem? Yeah, let's right do now? it. Okay. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly <laughs> streaming <laughs> and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still red oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the have this disintegrate into yet another series of personal attacks. Okay, Fatty? Wow, you are taking this so personally, Stephen. You'd think this was attacks on pompous windbags who make me sick, you fat ass. <laughs> Steve and I were at Second City together, which is an improv theater in Chicago, and I was his understudy, actually. And he did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> I've known Steven since 19, I want to say 87. Um, okay. We knew each other at Second City. We were in companies at Second City, and then we worked on the Dana Carvey show together. And oh. then he actually got me the job on The Daily Show. The year we went, we were told, this guy Steve Carell's not here tonight. And there was an understudy. And we watched the show, and, and the understudy just killed it in the improv set. And at the end of the night, I said, I really like the understudy. It was Colbert. Colbert was Carell's understudy. But they were absolute nobodies. And I want to emphasize that. I mean, these guys were nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true. I was, I don't know, I, I don't, uh, unemployed in Chicago, uh, absolutely no prospects of getting a job. My wife, she was out of a job, I was out of a job, and we had a brand new baby. And so I remember my mom asking, how are you doing? And I said, Mom, I know she doesn't have a job, and I don't have a job, and we got a new baby, and I don't know why, but I'm not worried. And it was a long pause. And my mom said, I don't know why either. And then it suddenly, I had this ice chip in my heart, which has never really gone away. And so I was like, I got to get a job, I got to get a job. Well, I, you know, I talked to him after all of, you know, all of this last thing happened. Actually, we texted each other. And I, I, what I was thinking is this, if he, if he does it right, this is the last job he'll ever have. This yeah. is, this is what he will be known for. Yeah. And it's so huge. And he's entered this, this enormous, um, you know, element of his career, this nor enormous period of his career. And um, it is, it is kind of amazing to think that back 20 years ago, we were just two goofballs yeah. improvising together. When he understudied for me, I did a scene in the show where I had to play the baritone horn, and I grew up playing the baritone horn. He never, he'd never played a, a, a brass instrument in his life. I skipped work, I called in sick, I just played 24 hours a day. I would go to sleep with it with me, and I'd wake up, my lips were just like purple. They were bruised and inverted from having to blow for six days. For some reason, he wasn't available to audition. At the last minute, he heard that I was looking for him. Hi, I'm Stephen Colbert. Uh, All he sent us was some crazy video of himself holding up his little daughter. 
Hey, everybody. I'm Baby, and I'm one of Stephen Colbert's characters. Yeah, every week I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it's like being a baby. So, these two guys walk into a bar, okay? And one of them starts wiping my ass with a voice towelette. It's, boy, does that feel good. Who's with me? And she had such a load in her pants. Her diaper was so full that it was leaking up the back of her onesie. And he was telling us how much he needed to support her. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't do this. It's not fair. I, I don't know how we're going to feed her <laughs> or clothe or give her what, you know, what we had. Why, why am I an actor? My brothers are lawyers. Some are camping. The old car. The kids have their own car. I don't have a car. The kids have cars. They're so old. Oh, you don't need to hear this. It's not your problem. And I think that's actually what got me the call back. No, it didn't. No, that was quite disturbing. Meet you. Nice to meet you. Please come by the house today and meet the children. I surely will. I love you. I love you. Oh, bye. God love you. Bye. What was that about? <laughs> uh, she's an old friend. Shirley Wentworth? Oh, I forgot to tell you. When I'm home, I'm an old black woman. <laughs> The finalists came out to L.A., and we were at Igby's, the club where I was discovered by Lorne Michaels. And everyone got up in front of a quasi-little audience. And whenever I see Steve in an audition, I'm like, well, that's it. I'm not going to beat Stephen Colbert out. <laughs> when I found out that Carell was auditioning, I was like, well, that's it. I'll never get the job now, because I mean, I'd hire Carell. Jackal picking at my brain. I hate you. I hate who you are and what you do and how you sound and what you say. You're like a cancer on my life. God! Give you a ride. Oh, God bless you, child. God bless you, Shirley. And very nice meeting you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess your hometown is a lot like this. No. No, my hometown is nothing like this. No, I don't go home and like suddenly become an old Chinese guy. Why, why would you? <laughs> really? <laughs> Corral, when he first came in the room, he just is too nervous. I generally did not audition very well, and I never got called for SNL, which is something I'd always wanted. So in my mind, it was sort of a big last shot. I, I was so, so nervous. I think they wanted an impression, and I don't do impressions but there were ABC people there, there were the producers, and there was Dana, and so I did the Pope, who at the time, I think it was John Paul II, who talked like this. Uh, my, my audition was just him saying things like, I do not understand what I am saying, but I learned to speak English phonetically. And Robert Smigel really thought that was funny. I can't believe he dropped into our lap. He was just, out of everybody who auditioned, he was just like, that guy's gonna be on the show. Like, there was no question. I was walking off the stage, and Dana came up and put his arm around me and said, I think you should feel pretty good about that. And I was like, oh my gosh, let's not, I hope that means what he think, I think that meant. Steve. That's a stupid thing to say, and you're a stupid person for saying it. <laughs> Nathan, is that you? <laughs> you remember. <laughs> How could I forget you? <laughs> I feel like I died going straight to heaven, like all my dreams have come true. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly.
Suddenly you've come back to accept my marriage proposal. <laughs> You can't think I can accept. You know I can't do that. This town would never accept a marriage between a white man and an old black woman. <laughs> We'd move. We'd move. Your roots are here, Nathan. I'd pull them out like an onion. <laughs> I'd shrivel like a raisin in the sun. <laughs> All I know is... My life would be so fulfilled if you'd give me your hand and... Who's your lovely friend? <laughs> this is Steve. Steve, this is Nathan. Finest man I know. <laughs> May I call on you later? <laughs> Lightning round! Oh, and before, so I, so I came out of the audition and I was feeling pretty good. And Steven was after me and I didn't, you know, tell him that it, uh, you know, I just, I didn't talk about it, but we were chatting, <laughs> we were chatting and I, I didn't realize he was kind of preparing and getting ready to go on. And I'm doing the rundown in my head of everything. I'm doing like the nine things I'm about to do and I'm running through it in my head. And Carell walks up to me and goes, how's Evie? How's, how's Evie doing? I just, uh, Nancy, just we just, we missed so seeing you guys out there. It was like, I was trying to like, remember the combination to a safe. And he's going, four, 28, seven, six, 3.14, like that. And I was like, so anyway, and I was just talking to him about stuff and he said, please, Le please, I ha I'm about to go on. Please go away. <laughs> God, please go away. I, I didn't know what else to say. <laughs> I'd better get back to the haberdashery. <laughs> Pleasure meeting you, Sarah. <laughs> He's a great guy. <laughs> Hush, little baby, don't say a word. <laughs> Papa's gonna buy you a mockingbird. You know, I've been giving this some thought, and well, um, maybe we need to commentate with other people for a while. <laughs> Have you been working with CNN's Robert Novak? <laughs> Bob appreciates me. I can smell him on you. I remember flying back from Los Angeles to Chicago to await my fate. And I landed back in Chicago, and it's winter time in Chicago, and I'm back in the apartment, and Ev, and, and I know that Carell gets the gig. Carell gets hired, like, on a Friday. And I'm like, well, that's it. There it is. Robert hadn't put out any other calls yet. You know, I was the first person he called, and, and I was, you know, asking him who else he's going to hire, and I remember him saying, well, we want to hire Colbert. And then he said, you want to call him? And I called Steven in Chicago, and I said, how do you feel about moving to New York and doing the show together? Madeline was asleep in her, in her like bassinet in the corner of the living room of our apartment. And I was like, yeah, that's great. Because the baby's asleep. I'm like, oh, wow, that's so fantastic. Okay, hold on one second. Like, are you there? We said you want, we want to hire you. Like, I know, hold on one second. So I would, out of the living room, into the back bedroom, close the door, into the bathroom, close the door, into the shower, and close the door, and yelled at the top of my lungs. Yay! And then I was off the next day, off to New York the next day. 
with the gig and everything's gonna be okay. The network gig and I was on it. We were on it. I couldn't believe, it was like the gig of gigs. It was such a big deal. There was such anticipation of what this show was gonna be like because well, ABC was putting it on primetime. What a mistake. <laughs> Steve, don't you see there is a deeper reality that transcends what you and I may debate here at this desk. Don't you know in your heart of hearts that we all bask in his eternal light? Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. Yes, I'm right. You're wrong, and I'm right. I win. I win. I win. You must be back in town because I woke up this morning with a strange feeling my property value had dropped. <laughs> you can say what you want, Randy. What are you doing showing your face around here, Shirley? You ain't got no right. You just pulled up your roots and ran. I had to leave, Raymond, because of men like you, shallow men, empty men, white and sepulchers full of corruption. Yeah, you! Just shut up, you goddamn racist! <laughs> After me. I am. I am. Somebody. Somebody. I am. I am somebody. Somebody. I am Sarah. This is gonna be hard for me. Somebody. I am Sarah. It's gonna be hard for me. Sarah, I am Sarah Brown, Brown, old black woman, old black woman, we all, every one of us have to come home again, some of us were born on the bottom, we live down the bottom. Steve Carell, The Office. Ricky Gervais. Extras. Ah. Ricky Gervais couldn't be here tonight, so instead we're going to give this to our friend Steve Carell. <laughs> 